In the first hours after the world found out that Stephen Stainer had not only been found, but was coming home to his family alive, the Stainers would begin to receive so many offers for the rights to their story that they had to hire a lawyer to deal with them. One producer would contact the family and tell them the story was one of the greatest of the century. But seven years was a long time to be apart, and during that time, both Stephen and the Stainer family had changed. They loved each other dearly, but were now just memories of each other. And in the midst of getting to know each other again, intrusions from the outside world would be near constants. The press, the police, and two trials meant Stephen's life would continue to belong to the world. As a hero and a survivor, you would hope he would get to have the life he deserved. But Stephen lived in a world where control of your own story went to the highest bidder, to the man the police were working to put in jail, and to those who never let Stephen forget he was still the boy who had been kidnapped. Join us in this episode of California True Crime, The Life and Kidnapping of Stephen Steiner, A New Normal. Welcome to this episode of California True Crime. This is part seven in our series, and we've covered Kenneth Parnell's life already, Stephen's kidnapping from his perspective and the family's, the kidnapping of Timothy White and what that was like for his family and Ukiah, Stephen escaping and saving Timothy, and last episode we talked about the first two days of Stephen's homecoming and the intrusion of the press. This is something we will continue to talk about in this episode. We will also be going over a myriad of things because when Stephen comes home, he has he just has a lot of things going on. He's getting to know his family again, but also the police are still investigating and asking him questions and looking for Parnell's accomplices. So even though it should feel like this is the end of the story, he's been home, he's been home, he's back with his family, it continues for everyone involved. And life never really gets back to normal. And that's something we want to highlight before we get to the issues at trial. And here to help me share those details with you are, of course, Charles and Sean. How are you both doing? I'm doing good. I'm good. I Maybe we should say, which I think is pointless, but I hear it in other podcasts. If this is your first episode listening to about Steven Stainer, stop and go back to the first, even though it's in the seventh. But I mean, hopefully, I, yeah, hopefully you've yeah. listened to all, all six leading up to this. So before we get into details of this episode, we want to share that next episode, part eight, will be entirely about the issues at trial. Once Stephen and Timothy escape, Parnell is arrested and held in Ukiah on $5,000 bail. He, has a, he also has a hold on him for Merced, which just basically means that if for any reason he was to make bail, he wouldn't be set free. He would instead be sent then to Merced for arraignment. And he's only being held right now for the kidnapping of Timothy White. But all the trial stuff, arraignments, preliminary hearings, that sort of thing, they start very quickly and all at the same time as the stuff we're going to be talking about tonight. And there are a lot of interesting details that we want to share with you about those trials, mainly because I think a lot of people listening, you might have heard this story before or listened to another podcast. So you know the big famous thing that people talk about when it comes to the trials is the the low sentence that Parnell gets. But there are really a lot of legal issues that get worked out and I was interested in, and I think people will find interesting and also parallel a lot of California history and changing viewpoints on abuse and kidnapping and victim blaming, which is my long way of saying that since all of this runs at the same time with the families and the public getting back to living their lives, we're just kind of separating those two issues so that it doesn't get too confusing. So this episode will be about what happens with the families next and the police and next episode will just be about the trials. This episode's information came from the Merced Sun Star, the Ukiah Daily Journal, and the Press Democrat out of Santa Rosa, as well as sort of a myriad of other newspapers. This is not really a story that dies down over time, especially because right after we left off last episode, the press is just getting details of Parnell's life, which means stories are still running every day. In fact, most of the information I found on his life that we talked about in part one of this series comes from the press, and they are very interested in this man's life. And truthfully, I think I researched, I think I just passed 500 articles on this crime. So I sort of feel like I know some of the reporters or the papers. And this just seems, for them, it seems like a really shocking story. Can you explain that? Like when you say shocking, 
I get the sense that they are surprised at Kenneth Parnell's history, which is understandable. It's a, it's a pretty bad history, and it's terrible what he did before. So would you say that the shock that the press is feeling is due to the child abuse that Kenneth Parnell inflicts on children and not the kidnapping? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously the kidnapping is the first thing. But what makes this really last, I think, is the information they get about Parnell is really shocking to them as well as to the public. And there are many things we'll discuss in this episode. And I think for us, we know more information about what happened to Stephen. The press doesn't yet. The family doesn't yet. And the kind of mar- and the kind of man Parnell is. But I think there are aspects of this case that are unbelievable, which bring a lot of interest. The kidnapping, as you said, being one of them, um, that's really statistically unlikely to be kidnapped. And then he comes home. That's statistically, un- that's even more unlikely that that happened. But after they escape and stories about Parnell's life come out, and late in March, the public will find out Stephen did suffer abuse. And this becomes more of a focus, that aspect of this case. And I'm a little torn on how some of this is handled. So we're going to go through it and talk about it and give you more insight. But I think moving forward, it's important to understand where California and really the United States is on understanding sexual abuse in 1980. Just to give you some context for some of the things that are going to happen in the next couple of episodes, as well as in this one. Because it's just kind of too easy to judge from our vantage point, things people do and say and don't really think about because we know what's going on and they don't. If you remember in our first episode in this entire series, we told you that according to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN, every nine minutes in America, a claim of child sex abuse is substantiated by Child Protective Services. According to RAIN, one in nine girls and one in 53 boys under the age of 18 have experienced sexual abuse. And these are numbers that change depending on what stats you're looking at. But these stats are never good. And these are numbers that aren't unique to now, to 2019. Throughout history of America and California, sex abuse is an issue that exists. But how we talk about it and what we understand that it is, is something that changes. So we're going to talk a little about the history of 1980 and what's going, been going on. And frankly, though, a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about, you can find these horrible stories in 2019. Not all that much has changed, and some of that is because of the history I'm about to give you. And the main reason I want to talk, do this is because much of what is written about Parnell and the crimes he commits in the first couple of days is about the kidnapping, which is really unusual, and then the boys escaping, which is equally unusual. But when it starts to focus in on his past crimes and what he's done and the sexual abuse parts, people are sort of still just as shocked, if not even more so. And I think that's an interesting thing because... Those statistics that we just talked about mean that far too many people who are following this story and reading about it have experienced this in some way themselves. Either they've been hurt or someone they know has. And for me, learning the history behind that, and I'll share, that, like I said, we're going to share that here, was really important because this story is so frustrating and heartbreaking. But using the details to fix the problems that still exist, I think, is really important. And the problems that keep people from coming forward and telling someone, and we've covered several of those issues in this case this season, but these are problems that still exist and keep people from coming forward. And this is a history that, again, I saw to share it with you, um, has only started to change around the time, around 1980, and a little bit before that. It was a very modern history for us in California and in the United States. And that's the frustrating thing, is that it's not that long ago, but the but we're still dealing with either ramifications from those problems or trying to solve those or still dealing with them and still feeling shocked that, that those things go on. Right. But for me, learning this history, I don't know, it gave me a better idea of where I stand or what we should be doing because it really surprised me how much of this has only happened within probably our parents' lives. It's very, very recent and there's a place for us to pick it up and keep moving forward. So the majority of the information I got for this section, in case anybody wants to look up more information, is from a U.S. Department of Health and Human Services report called the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, and it was a report done in 2014. So apparently prior to the Great Depression in America, parenting was really considered something you did behind closed doors, and not just parenting, a lot of things. People weren't really trusting of the government, and they didn't want them passing laws telling them what to do. That's easily something you might also hear in 2019, and there are always questions on how far the government should go, but in the 20th century, this would have been just a no-go topic for people. After the Great Depression and World War II, people around the country got a better idea of how government could help, and in the form of stimulus or other things like Social Security, for instance, they could provide positive improvements. Until this time, 
When kids needed help, they were often shipped off. We talked about reform schools early in the podcast, and those went farther back than the ones that Parnell went to in the 30s. There was a huge history of reform schools that were really dangerous and more like work camps for kids. People didn't really lose their kids, as we understand that today. And children who experienced sexual abuse were often expected to keep that to themselves, even more so than I think what we're kind of accustomed to now. And we can unfortunately talk about several instances in the last few years with high-profile cases where adults were told about abuse and children were either not believed or ignored or just not listened to. And that's an attitude I think we've talked about goes way back. And then you add in the misunderstanding of what's happening in sexual abuse. A lot of the stereotypes of abusers we talked about in episode one uh, last into the 1980s. We talked about Anita Bryant. But aside from hurting people who aren't hurting kids, the other things that happens is that all the stereotypes get dropped sort of into a pot. So all these ideas about what someone who, who maybe who was gay might do to your kids, which we now know is not true, but those get all kind of put into a similar pot and then pushed back onto victims. And we'll talk about that more when we talk about bullying, but it's just kind of an idea of what's going on at the time. But even kids themselves are not considered at this time or early in our history to be, I think now we consider kid being a kid as a time unto itself. It's its own thing. We do our best to protect it. But that's not really how people thought of childhood. Child, kids worked in factories from a very young age. And only when we start passing laws and we start sending kids to school and we start thinking about that a little bit differently, do we start to worry about what happens as well in the home with children? And in 1962, a doctor named C. Henry Kemp published a paper called, quote, The Battered Child Syndrome. He was a doctor who laid out evidence of purposeful child abuse and how children present with that. So before this, there wasn't really a system to, for a doctor to notice that someone has a lot of bruises or broken bones, and they might be receiving that in the home. It included some guidelines for recognizing this, and it also included some guidelines for recognizing emotional abuse. By the late 1960s, most states will take this issue seriously, in big part because of this man. He starts pushing for it, both with the doctors in the Pediatric Association and as well as in Congress. And I mean, there's still things about this we're still talking about today. What is physical abuse? Is spanking physical abuse? And it's still kind of a, a conversation, I think, that happens. It is mentioned in the laws that he's talking about or that start to get passed. Sexual abuse is mentioned. It's always kind of included, but it's not really the focus of what they're talking about. So this is just in the 60s, the beginning of even thinking about what happens to kids in the home and the beginning of thinking about how we treat them. And the focus is mainly on physical abuse. Which is great. I mean, it's, it's given all of the kind of ne- bad history we've gone over, it's interesting to see that as early as 1962, they're looking at it and making a concerted effort or somebody's making a concerted effort to document child abuse and what that is and allow people to almost have rules to go by. On the other hand, it's disheartening that it took up until 1962 for somebody to actually say, you know what, we really need to take a look at this problem. Well, when you think about having to change people's minds, not just about abuse or about how they raise their kids, but also change their minds about the role government should play. But this is sort of the beginning of people really beginning to discuss these things. And I think we've seen in a lot of our cases and our histories um, about those that what people are actively talking about is really important to change. And this is all happening when you think about it in the 60s and leading up to the 70s, right when Stephen Daner gets kidnapped. And in the 1970s, the Senate creates a subcommittee on children and youth. It's the very first of its kind, aimed to look at the experiences of children and to make recommendations. It was headed by California Senator Walter Mondale, and they hold hearings on child abuse and neglect. This led to landmark legislation called CAPTA, the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, signed by Richard Nixon. Most states in the 1960s did not have a system set up to deal with child abuse. CAPTA created a grant system for states to do just that, and it's still in use today, helping states improve things like assessments and intakes. And in the 1970s and 80s, we see the creation of systems like Child Protective Services here in California. My point is that Stephen Stainer is living in a world that is just beginning to understand physical abuse, and much of what is talked about is just that, a kind of focus on that specific kind of abuse. So even though we know that sexual abuse is not an anomaly, lots of people are experiencing it, unfortunately, and have firsthand knowledge of some of the things that he's experienced himself, 
So it is something far too many people experience. Although most sexual abuse is not committed by the Parnells of the world, we haven't really talked about that, we will. It's a separate issue. Um, it is an all too common phenomenon. But at the same time, the people, including the press and the people in these communities, they're still just learning how to handle it. And I wanted to set that up as we go forward because a lot of the shocking stuff is about to occur. And it's good to keep that in mind when you're thinking about the time period. And it's also good to keep in mind that understanding sexual abuse is really something I think that's happened in our lifetime and in our parents' lifetime. As I said, it's really a modern history. And it's something that we can positively contribute to, either by more understanding of victims, being better listen, listeners, being careful not to victim blame. There's just a whole bunch of stuff that we can do because I really think this history taught me, and it's just a little bit, hopefully we can do more and maybe a bonus episode, but this history taught me that we're supposed to continue what these people started. It's right. that near to us. We've Just in, in what you've reported and what, what we've been reading over these past episodes and then for all the time that you've been researching the case, we have seen like how far we've come, but, but that's, that's not the end. There's still a lot more to do. Right. So this is the world that all of the families find themselves in. In last episode, we discussed um, the mood when Stephen and Timothy escape Parnell being one of celebration. And the mood for the White family in Ukiah is also very celebratory. They spent the last 16 days searching for Timothy. Ultimately, police thought they might be searching for a body, and now he's home. On March 2nd, just the day after Timothy and Stephen escape, the White family have a barbecue at their home with some family and friends to celebrate. Ukiah, like Merced, is swamped with journalists. They're going out to the Manchester ranch and doing interviews, but pretty quickly, Timothy's parents begin limiting his time with journalists. And everything I saw in the research when I was looking into this, I saw an article, for instance, when the women in Cleveland were found in 2013, and uh, the news had interviewed other people who had been victims of a similar crime. They suggested that one of the things that really helped them heal was not having access, not giving access to journalists. Another thing it could have been, because it seems like the family pushed back on the journalists, I mean, Tim, Timothy being so young, he might not have been able to be like an adult and hold back his emotions or his expressions yeah. to, uh, and the parents could see it, that he is not really liking talking to journalists. Yeah, that's, that's completely possible. I didn't see anything specific to that, but I think, you know. Just a parent's intuition in a way of watching their child, how he reacts, maybe. Yeah, that makes sense. And maybe for... For Tim, or not Timothy, for Stephen, it might be a little harder because he does look older. I mean, the the photographs and stuff of him when he comes home, it's hard to remember that he's only 14. So maybe that might have a... And he, it didn't seem like he had anyone helping him, like, right. you know, on his side. And and the difference between seven years and, you know, two and a half weeks, not not discounting what the White family went through, but they they still had a relationship with their son. So you're right. The protective nature's still there. Not that the stainers weren't protective of Stephen. It's just they're having, there's too much, almost like there's too much to do in that instance. Well, I think both families are just making, neither of them really know what's going to happen or what to expect next. So they're both making just decisions sort of on the fly. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're, it's easy to see now that maybe one was a better decision than the other. And that's not what I'm trying to say. I just think in this case, they choose this path and it probably works out. The White family want Timothy to get back to his regular life and routine as quickly as possible. The family are very grateful to the town and all the help they gave looking for Timothy. And Timothy is a local celebrity around the town for a while. The Ukiah Daily Journal says that he gets free ice cream cones at all the places around town. And people are just excited to see him when he's walking around. A local radio station, KUKI, received hundreds of calls asking him to get Timothy on the air. It seems that people are really worried about him and they, they won't believe that he's okay until they hear his voice. Um, and the quote I saw is they ask him to come on to, quote, reassure his listeners. He's a celebrity. His listeners? Yeah. <laughs> Timothy goes with his dad to the station, and he introduces his favorite records, which are My Sharona by The Knack and On the Radio by Donna Summer. I think that is the two most amazing records for a five-year-old to be their favorite songs. Timothy also receives a shirt from the Stainer family at one point. The Stainers know Stephen is being called a hero, but to them without Timothy, Stephen might never have escaped, so they think, you know, they helped each other. So Timothy's a hero to them. The shirt they send Timothy says, quote, I'm somebody special. It's 
probably the best shirt. It's probably like K made it with iron on, so you could just see in the eighties, just pure like big letters, probably really colorful. That's I'm trying to imagine walking around town with like a huge ice cream <laughs> and his like headphones and listening, shirt on. Listening yeah. to Donna Summer. Yeah. But that's important too to remember to remind is that and I think that's one thing that I highlighted when we talk about the white family is is Timothy's story is as important as Stevens. Right. And it's hard to imagine a scenario which would have caused him to come forward. And this one does. And it also reminds me of the person in the truck who we really, who picks them up. Yeah. It's another instance of the if that man. hadn't happened. Because they went a couple other times to come into town and no one stopped. And that one night, someone did. Just some man on a back road in a pickup truck that nobody knows. The best man in the world. <laughs> it really is. If you're out there. Yeah. Yeah, if you're... If, if you're listening to this and you know anything about this person, please contact us at CaliTrueCrime at gmail.com. The White family are very interested in treating Timothy as normally as possible, and he goes back pretty quickly to doing just normal, everyday kid stuff. The paper will note most of the time he's playing outside with friends. He eats, they, they talk about him eating bologna sandwiches. Just normal stuff kids should be doing. I can, can you imagine as a parent, your child has been kidnapped for two and a half weeks? And then you, I just can't imagine that idea, that that feeling like he leaves the front door. I don't know. I don't know if I'd be that that okay well, with it I, right away. I bet they're not at all. But they have to get back to the routine, just right. like they were saying. And That's it's probably point. not easy. You, it was probably months, and it could have been years that she always had that fear. Right. But she still had to do it. Right. You don't want to. You don't want your fear to 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 make things worse for your child. On March 8th, six days after he escaped, Timothy goes back to school. His class starts the day with questions for Timothy. His kidnapping is traumatizing to a lot of the children in school. They have questions for him. I mean, it was a lot for the entire town to go through. It's another example of, of the crime victimizing more than the actual victim. It's the community. And, and in this case, chil- more than just Timothy, other children. After he answers them, they get right to their lessons. Eventually, Timothy will also go back to walking to his babysitter's house after school, even as many of the kids in the area are still getting driven, just sort of out of fear. And this is true throughout Mendocino. Calasms are spending time talking about what happened. Some kids knew Stephen or were friends with him. Others are just having trouble processing what went on. Though Parnell is in jail, both families become aware pretty quickly that police in Ukiah and in Merced are looking for a person or persons who helped Parnell kidnap their sons. The police early on don't know if it might be the same person in both cases. This is something that even though you have your son back and Parnell is in jail, but you just don't know who that person is that's still out there. And if there's some reason they want your child in particular, or if they're coming back, it's just, it has to still be in the back of your mind. Going back to what you said too, about all the places that Stephen went to school. Right. Stephen doesn't go back. I mean, t- I would think that would be kind of traumatic for Stephen's friends in that area because he goes back to Merced. So for some of those people, there's no closure. There's no, like, this person who I knew as someone else come to find out is some completely different person, you know, his friends or, or those people that had those relationships. And we know from episode four that Sean Poorman is the 14-year-old that assisted Parnell in the kidnapping of Timothy White, but the police are still in the dark on this. When Parnell's arrested, he doesn't talk to them at all. So they have no other information. And it also seems as if they aren't too sure they can trust Timothy's memory on this. He wasn't able to give them a very good description of the man who grabbed him. And he remembers that he had a hat and tennis shoes, but no details about his face. And I think we talked about how quickly that kidnapping happened and that he might not have ever even seen Sean Poorman's face. Right. It was a lot different than, than Stephen's kidnapping, which was a kind of a gradual talking in the car. He, he, Timothy was grabbed. And then covered up and thrown in the back seat. Right. Another thing with kids, when they you see them in fear, they'll look away, they'll cover their face. You never know. Yeah. yeah. Right. Police are at a loss. Timothy's adamant there was a second person. The White family believe him and want this person found. And the public at large know that Timothy has said there's a second person. So they're also kind of freaked out and scared. And I don't think anyone will be settled until there's an exhaustive investigation into this issue. To help with this, police decide that they might be able to get a better description from Timothy if they hypnotize him. And hypnotism is a big deal in the 1980s specifically, and it's a complicated and often misunderstood concept. 
But that's not to say there aren't very big issues with hypnotizing people, especially victims or witnesses. And after Timothy goes missing, the police hypnotize, if you remember, hypnotize witnesses, hoping there's something that they stuck in their memories that they might be able to, to get. The kind of hypnotism that we're talking about here is often mistaken or compared to stage hypnotism, where someone controls your mind after waving a timepiece on a chain in front of your face. Hypnotism, when used by someone like here with Timothy, is really more about getting a person to relax. Although that isn't to say that there aren't, as I said, some pretty big complications and danger with actually doing this. And we we kind of became interested in hypnotism because we've seen it in, we saw it in the Keddie case where the kids are hypnotized many times, I believe. And then also in just cases we've talked about around California at the time. Um, two cases which are use hypnotism that are pretty widely known are the Chowchilla bus case and the Mary Vincent case. Both of these are out of California. And California in, generally, in general has a really unique history of hypnotism that we won't go into here. Hopefully we can maybe do a bonus episode about this too because it's super interesting. But in the 1980s, basically bolstered by famous cases, including the two I just mentioned, um, this becomes something that's done quite a bit. Two things to remember. Hypnotism is not a recognized technique for getting information. And for every case where it's cited as successful, there are many, many more cases where it failed or produced results that put someone who was innocent in jail, for instance. And there are a couple reasons for this. Number one, human memories are very malleable. And during hypnosis, what people can remember can be manipulated and cha- even change how they remember it. And number two, memories are really tricky. So after hypnosis, some victims or witnesses, if they remember something, um, even if it's something that didn't happen or they look at it in a way that doesn't really help, they can start to believe that that memory is much more reliable than it really is because they remembered it under hypnotism. So it can reinforce their false memories. So that's where you get cases with false memory or, or they call it like recovered, recovered, like faulty recovered memories. Right. And often we'll hear stories where um, those memories weren't as accurate, even sometimes didn't happen. And there are cases where um, during hypnosis, something that the person who was hypnotizing the person put into their thoughts became part of their memory, and then they put into the case, and then it turns out the person was innocent. And often what I read was that those cases aren't as widely covered as cases where someone used hypnotism and it actually helped. Right. So it's, it's, we're going to record the instances and we'll publicize the instances where we're right, but I'm not really going to talk about the 17 or 18 times that I got it wrong or the, the, the times that because of that, somebody went to prison that was probably innocent. Right. And in California, information got under, gotten under hypnosis is not admissible in a court of law. And in fact, once hypnosis becomes something used a lot of the time, a lot of famous hypnotists come out against using it for these purposes, including the amazing Kreskin himself, because he does it on stage, it's an act, but he knows it can be really dangerous. Which, that's a big deal. I mean, the amazing Kreskin was all over the TV. He would have been a household name for people, especially like, you know, watching on the Johnny Carson show and... And and one of the major reasons is that they come out against this um, is that obviously the stuff we talked about, the ways that it's dangerous, but also because of who's doing it. So in 1980, when Timothy White is hypnotized, he's hypnotized by a district attorney named Dick Finn, um, and he does this on March 5th, 1980. And we've seen this in a couple of cases. In the Katie case, I remember being very surprised when I heard about this, because you don't hear about hypnotism too much now in court in these cases, and partially probably because it's not admissible what you get. But um, in that case, I remember the person was part of the police force who hypnotized someone, uh, the young the young man in the case. And he said he had taken like a two-day seminar. And I had to look that up because that just, it really surprised me. That just seemed unbelievable. That this is a technique you would allow or do to a child. And you don't really actually need to be a professional. Well, and the case you mentioned earlier, the Mary Vincent case, in that case, the person who, who did the, the hypnotizing, same thing. It was, I think it was less than a two-day course. And that person was the only, he was being loaned out to other police departments to do it and, and would come in. Now, in that case, the description that they got was very accurate. Right. But it's, I think, it, to me, it feels a lot like the, the um, lie detector, mm-hmm. where I think I think where most of us are familiar with the idea that you know lie detectors aren't admissible in court, and there's a million ways that you can get around it, and it's not always reliable. 
but it doesn't dissuade me from when somebody says they refuse to take the lie detector test. There is that little voice in the back of my head said, well, if you know, he's that person's not lying, why wouldn't they take a lie detector test? Right. There are lots of reasons why they shouldn't Ex- take a lie detector exactly. test. Exactly. Yeah. Same way as if, you know, I police want to hypnotize you, then... And I don't know this man's background. I know he's an attorney. He's not, this is not his job. He's not a professional. It just happens that this happens in 1980, which is kind of the heyday of when this is going on. And in California, um, there, in LA in particular, there's a whole police force created just to do hypnotism. Um, so it's really interesting. But a lot of it is just, you know, like you said, a two-day course or an afternoon and you learn to do this. So it's not as if someone who has studied this all their life or and studied the implications of it and how to do it right and how to protect, you know, kids or not accidentally insert ideas into their head is doing it. Are you a true crime junkie that's looking for a different perspective? Have you ever read about a famous case and wondered how it was possible that a defendant got acquitted? Are you interested in criminal justice reform? Do you often find yourself making extraordinarily inappropriate jokes while swearing like a sailor? Then the Getting Off podcast is for you. Hosted by us. Two real live criminal defense attorneys. Getting Off explains the legal reasons behind outcomes in famous trials and tackles tough topics in the world of crime and criminal justice. We use first-hand sources like trial transcripts, police reports, crime scene photographs, and appeals briefs to give you the information that the public rarely hears about when it comes to the criminal justice system. Our podcast isn't about carefully crafted musical interludes or obsessively edited narratives. Instead, it is a no-holds-barred, unedited, raw legal presentation by two lawyers that have spent over a decade each in the trenches. Previously covered cases include Casey Anthony, Michael Peterson, Jody Arias, and more. Subscribe to the Getting Off podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean, or wherever else you get your podcasts. Do that to get off now. There are conflicting details on whether police get any more details from Timothy under hypnotism. They tell the press that it was successful and they got a more detailed description and a sketch, but they never released any of this information to the press. And the police tell other people that they didn't get more information on the second suspect. Later in the press, it also seems like the description Timothy gave while hypnotized was pretty similar to the one he had already given them. And I just think he he might not have seen Scott Poorman's face, and he can't give them details he doesn't have. Either way, the police don't release the information and instead make a plea in the Ukiah Daily Journal that they think whoever helped Parnell might have been duped into helping him. They're hoping someone will come forward if they understand the police are on their side and get that he tricked them. Police also turn their focus to people Parnell knew, and in particular, a bar Parnell would go to almost every day after his shift at the Palace Hotel. They seem to think this is a place Parnell spent a lot of time, perhaps he found someone there to help him. The bar is called the Samoa Club. The Samoa Club in 1980 was at 110 West Stanley Street and was run in the 1940s by a man named Slim Smith, and the tagline for the bar was, meet the gang here. In the 80s, it has a different owner, and I think eventually in the late 80s, it will move locations as well. Either that or there were two bars in the same area named Samoa Club. And I also saw a steak with a restaurant with that name too, Samoa. So I don't know what's going on with that. And there isn't even a building I could find now with this exact address. I believe the Samoa Bar would be around the area where a restaurant called Chop Chop is now in Ukiah. And in the 1980s, sort of that general time period, the Samoa bar often had live music in the form of, quote, Ray Morgan and Marsha at the country keyboard and a band called True Country, and there was no cover to get in. So it's it's always more like a a country western bar? It kind of sounds like it. According to the owner of the bar, the police had been there every day after Stephen and Timothy escaped and were interviewing people. It seems that Parnell would come in after his shifts, often in the morning, and have several beers before going home. This bar was just about a half block or so, maybe not even that from the Palace Hotel. It was kind of like Caddy Corner across the street. They were just maybe hoping that he maybe had too many drinks and told one of his friends something to to help with the case? Or Yeah, I think either, based on the information they get, he's either at work or he's at home. So this is sort of a place where... This is the only place around town that he has, has been to repeatedly? Yeah, I mean, all the time it seems like. He spent a lot of time so there. So it's like other than home and work, this is his... One hangout spot. Yeah, so maybe there was someone there he convinced to help him. Well, and like like you said, Sean, too, it's a pretty good... People hang out at bars, they have too much to drink. It's a, 
maybe they were hoping that maybe he spilled his guts about something he did. Although I don't know how many people are there in the morning time. Oh, I dated a girl who, she worked the graveyard shift, and everyone went to the glowworm after and cashed their checks and just drank it up in the morning. So you never know. And then one of the bars in town here, they still, they make the most money from the morning shift. Oh, that's interesting. So there were plenty of people. Yeah. I guess, you know, if you do work graveyard, work late nights, what do you do when you get off of work? Like people work, you know, regular shifts or swing shifts. Yeah. You go to have a drink. Or more. Or more. And more. (laughs) Police in Ukiah are also spread thin. Not only are they looking for this accomplice, but both Ukiah and Merced police are interviewing and looking for people Parnell knew throughout the years. They've gotten calls from people who knew Parnell or who lived near him, and they report that he had a wife named Barbara, and some of the time he had other children with him besides Stephen. This Barbara they're talking about is Barbara Mathias, and I believe the other children that they saw were her kids. She has several kids, and specifically when she lived with Parnell, she brought her five-year-old to live with them. And that's during 75, 76 era? Yeah, around that time, yeah. Although I do want to say that this doesn't seem like a murder case in in some of the other cases we've covered where the police are investigating as similarly, where they're just kind of following up on every single clue. In fact, the ca- both cases are closed pretty quickly. They have someone they've caught, they've put him in jail. So this information is more about the trial and deciding what charges to bring against Parnell. Even though the boys have come home safely, in Mendocino, fear and anger is still really high. They're opening the paper every day, the week after the escape, to find more and more details about Parnell, and those details do not set people at ease. And in Mendocino, it's even more difficult because this is someone who's more known in the area, and not just with people who live there or who looked for Timothy. I mean, those people are processing as well, but for people who knew Parnell differently, people he worked with, people he hung out with at the bar, people he became friends with. And they don't really understand who this person is that the newspaper is reporting on and this, this background of hurting kids. And I think it all, it's like the same way with like John Wayne Gacy. He was citizen of the year. Everyone knew right. him. And then this all comes out. People are shocked. Well, yeah. a, lot, a lot of serial offenders are like that, though. I know every time they catch somebody, it's, it seems like the first thing that they interview neighbors or coworkers, no, we had no idea, no, you know. And I think this is one of the reasons that we're, for two reasons that we like to report on the place is because these crimes also affect people in the area and the people, not just the people they directly happen to, but also because this is also one of the things that makes it difficult for people to come forward because of our ideas about what makes someone an offender don't exactly match up with the truth. And that's a difficult obstacle for victims to overcome. The idea that it, if I if I come forward and say, that this person is hurting me or this person committed a crime and I know it because of the way other people view that person, I may not be believed. Right. I mean, it's the same thing we see a lot with when now in, in recent history with um, sexual assault and victims being afraid of coming forward and talking about being sexually assaulted because their assaulter was somebody in a position of power. Right. Someone you would never believe would do this. And for me, I really saw this in two different stories here. The first is that Parnell had a good friend. We talked about her a little bit, who had a little boy. And he was asking her if he could be the child's father. Um, and she goes to the jail to just to talk to him because after this comes out, she's very angry. This was someone she welcomed into her home, was someone that was more like family, a good friend. And she wants to directly ask him if he was after her child. And then the second story that I that also... I think really embodies this, is a woman who gives an interview with the newspaper. She's elderly and was a neighbor of Parnell and Stephen and Comchi. And after her husband passed away, Parnell and Stephen took care of her. They fixed things in her house, had meals with her, and Stephen would stay with her when Parnell would visit his mother in Bakersfield. And in her interview, I think it really highlights how torn up she is about this. This is, I mean, this is someone she's had for, for meals, someone who's been very different in her life than he was for the people he's hurt. And she's listening to people. I mean, because Mendocino, they're really angry. They're, and they should be. They're calling up radio stations and threatening his life. And for her, this is someone she knows in an entirely different capacity. She calls Parnell an underdog and a quiet man. And she says, quote, Ken wasn't an ogre. He's just a small type shy man. He was always a perfect gentleman. And that quote, 
does two things. It both tells you how difficult this is on the people who knew him and Stephen. And also it feeds into the some of the stereotypes we were talking about before. That someone can't do these horrible things if, they're, if they come off as shy or if they're small. And it probably also helps Parnell in his manipulation of others. Again, I'm not trying to shame this woman for her opinion or for her experience or for any of the people that we're talking about in these episodes. But for me, this just puts the focus back on all the difficult things involved in people coming forward and the manipulation someone like Parnell participates in. You're up against people who think a person can't be helpful or caring and also hurt children, or he's small. And I don't entirely know how to fix these ideas, but we have to keep talking about it because it just it keeps happening. I think that's the only way you really, you're right, the only way you can combat that is because even now I think we're still combating the idea that bad people, there's some mark on them or they look, you know, the mark of Cain. You can tell an evil person who does evil from somebody who does good. But like you said earlier, Sean, John Wayne Gacy was citizen of the year, right? Helped out charities. He happened to also be killing young men and burying them in a crawl space. Parnell, he did a horrible act to Stephen and another boy that we know of, but that doesn't mean he wasn't nice to his mom or that. And I think that's looking at the nuances of it. Yeah. It's hard to accept those contradictions right. and just and like, it's scary. Yeah. And just like we talked about with the idea that Stephen's friends that didn't know him as Stephen have to go through their own process of understanding the, the city of Ukiah and, and all the places that we've talked about that Parnell lived at have to kind of go through their own process of understanding that what they saw was only one p- public face that he was giving, you know, I mean, he's, he's a practice manipulator. He's been doing it practically his entire life. Right. So everyone is getting life back together in Ukiah the week after the kidnapping. When the man who owns the Manchester cabin that Parnell and Stephen were living in goes out to kind of take stock of what needs to be done. You'll remember Stephen left animals there that need to be taken care of and police searched the cabin that first night after the escape. And they've taken a few things from the house, not very much. Timothy White's jacket and clothes, uh, they found the valentines that he had that Friday when he was kidnapped. And they also found several boxes of letters from Parnell's mother to Parnell. The letters in particular were found in a barn near the cabin. When the man who owns the cabin arrives, it's clear that reporters have also been through the cabin. I don't think it's cordoned off or anything, and I don't know how a case like this would be handled today. I was surprised in this instance that it wasn't cordoned off and sort of how it's handled. But, I mean, it's not a murder case, so it's not handled the same way. But it still seems like that the reporter should have. Th- this guy seemed he had to give him permission. No, I think they just showed up and went inside. So, illegally, they searched the place? Yeah, I mean, I don't know the, all the legality behind that, but they come well, in. Well, it's, it's not a crime scene. But at the same time, if reporters decided to just come into my house without permission... Right. It's illegal. Right, but that would hinge on whether the property owner gave the reporters permission to be on his property. Right, and I didn't see anything that said they ever asked or that he even knew they had been there. The boys are found, you know, at midnight, and there's mm-hmm. already, the police get there around 4 a.m., and the next day, reporters are going through. So it's a pretty big property. I don't know if he knew they were there or could have called police. Also, would it be because of the, you, I mean, you mentioned it earlier that... They have part by this point. They have Parnell in custody. They're tracking down these leads. I wonder if not not that they're doing wrong, but they're but they have the bad guy in prison. I mean, or they they have the bad guy in jail. It's it's. But even at this point, reporters in this time of the '80s mm-hmm. should know that just because they're in jail doesn't mean they're convicted, and they shouldn't be jacking everything up that could go towards a case. Right, you're absolutely correct because anything that they did or found or or destroyed con- yeah, or, or contaminated <laughs> yes then a defense attorney could use that in their favor and they do come into the cabin it to the man who owns the place it appears that there are photo albums for instance that have been rifled through and pictures are missing and a lot of the photos from my understanding that we see in the paper of Stephen and parnell are from those photo albums so i think the press whoever that is comes in and takes pictures that they then print So while out there, the man also decides to go across the street to look in a barn um, he has on his property over there. While doing so, he finds a box of photos inside the barn. Not knowing what this is or who it belongs to, he goes through them and discovers something very disturbing. At least some of the photos inside the box are of a new child that turns out to be Stephen. He looks closer to the age of his kidnapping. 
After finding the photos, he takes them to the police, and on March 5th, there are newspaper stories about him finding the photos, and he answers the press's questions about the photos, and he gives an explanation or description of what's in the photos in, in really great detail, and those details are printed in the paper. So he takes these photos to the police department, turns them in, and then goes out and has and talks to the reporters and describes the photos in graphic detail? Yeah, I'm not sure when he meets the reporters, it doesn't say how they got in touch with him or anything like that, or even how they found out about the photos, but he does, they do get in touch, and he does describe the photos in detail. And I think this has to be really difficult because you're, I mean, Stephen Zimmer said he's with his family, they don't have any more information than anybody else on what the police are thinking, and then this appears, you wake up and this is in the paper. But it's, I'm, this one shocked I'm more shocked. I mean, we've talked about some of the, the mistakes that the, the press has made during this. And I think that printing these kind of details before a trial, before anything, bef- that, that that's... It's not even that. It's that if the press knows this whole story, they know that they have a 14-year-old who's going to go back into school. And by describing pictures in the paper of him nude as a child, do you think... No one's going to bring that up in high school to him. I think this is this should be a crime in itself. Any scrap of privacy that Stephen had before is gone with these, with this pictures, with this description. On top of which, the person who t- who talked, the the owner of the land, to me that is unconscionable. Like how I I, I can't. I feel like I'm stuttering now, but it makes me angry that somebody would see that understand that, that what that child had went through and then after turning it into police decides I'm going to go talk to the press. Well, I think it's hard because I can't tell you what he thought when he found those photos or if this is a person who even I mean to us it's clear what's going on. Um but I don't know at the time if it is to this man. I understand 100% what you're both saying, but I don't know. The second thing is it is I mean we I'm not going to give you the specific details that are printed because it's unnecessary here. But these are details that are not even that bad because a trial is coming and details are going to get a lot worse and they'll also be printed. And I'm not suggesting that that makes this okay. I don't know. And I don't know what it means for something to be necessary for the public to learn. This is a man who has hurt kids and he's possibly hurt more kids. And I think it's important for people to know, maybe not in detail what he did to them, but to understand that he, if he came into contact with your kids or with other kids, that it's okay for you to say something. Right. And I don't know if this makes it harder or it helps. Sometimes it helps to know someone went through exactly what you did and you feel more comfortable coming forward. I can understand that. But I can also see that it might hurt. You might say, well, they're just going to print details. I don't want that. I'm not coming forward. This is a case to me that really shows a lot of crimes are very personal. And we're looking at this and thinking, how is Stephen going through this? But crimes are also about social ideas. These are crimes that are happening to lots of people, and we're not talking about them. And it's horrible that we have to talk about it, and it affects one specific person, but it also might help other people. The, the abuse that Stephen suffered at the hands of Parnell is not an isolated incident. It goes, I mean, countless people are, are, have had to suffer through this. I just hate the idea, and I think anyone would, that somebody found evidence of that, and they're... I mean, it's great he turned him into the police department, but then to turn around and say, I'm going to splash all of these private details without any context, without any... Th- uh, to me, right now, it sounds like without any thought to the victim is is terrible. And I understand what you're saying, Jessica, but I think I have to disagree with you in just the point that the press, this is Stephen, this is Stephen's life. They had no right. They should have asked Stephen first, mm-hmm. who would say, no, don't do that, but... They should have involved him. He's a 14-year-old. And a, and I understand what you're saying about Parnell and everything like that, but it's still, there's no way that this is right what they printed. No, and I, I don't disagree with you. I think it's just, for me, I don't know where the line is between which details matter and which, and which details, details don't. And I think part of that has come from doing this podcast. For me, learning details of some of the crimes has challenged the way I believe about things like laws and what we should do about them. And without those details... Sometimes I think, and I don't know that everyone's reading this and taking it to heart and thinking about it, but sometimes I think the details matter because otherwise we just kind of shake our head and it's not as big a deal and we lessen the crime in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, I know we've, I I think the three of us uh, in the last 
year that we've done this and the time before we talked about it and the time in between when we've had the, I think we've all had those conversations about the difference between a graphic detail and the, why are we doing it? Is it, is it to entertain an audience or is it, are we putting it in a story for a deeper meaning? And I, I guess the intent of, for these newspapers is as important as the fact that they did it. I think I agree with you that, that even for, for a victim knowing that somebody else went through their, their pain, maybe making that feel more comfortable coming out. But I don't think in that case, it would be the job of a newspaper to do that. I think I just, I, this for me falls back on the police department, making sure that certain things weren't shared. Yeah, and I think you're both right. I just, I don't know where the, the line is always drawn. Right. And this made me very angry, frankly. So I'm not trying to disagree yeah, with it, you. I think it makes all of us angry. Yeah. Right. I also want to mention that there isn't a lot of police in these stories. And that's because this is all happening at the same time trial stuff is getting started. Like I said, we will be talking about that um, next episode or the episode after. But the judge in Timothy White's case has issued a gag order against the police and the district attorney in the case, and also the defense, from talking to the press. And a gag order is just something that keeps these people specifically from talking to the press. The press can still report things, um, but there isn't a lot of context being added into any of these stories, like the pictures by the police, because they're not really allowed to do so. And mainly because uh, the judge in the case is worried about um, Parnell having the right to a fair trial and then finding a jury of people who aren't affected by this case. And every day there's a new story about Parnell in the press. What I find interesting is though the gag order only affects the police and the district attorney and not the people that are actually um, reporting all of the stuff that they're getting, which is leading to Parnell, I would imagine, having a harder time getting a fair trial then, right? Yeah. Um, What I would say though is that I think a, the hope is that they'll can kind of stem the amount of information coming to the press. But also B, in California, a judge can issue a gag order against the press. But historically, those have not stood up to scrutiny when the press will fight back because of the both the Constitution. But in California, actually, the right of the free press is um, protected even more under our state constitution than it is under the federal constitution. So you So it's basically like two versions of the First Amendment. You have the state version of the First Amendment, and then you have the actual First Amendment. Right. But it is kind of funny that the judge orders district attorney and police. So the people who would probably have the closest facts cannot tell the press the facts. The press are just going to print what they get from any Joe Schmo on the corner who saw someone drinking at the Palace Hotel and and stuff like that. Right. Well, and like you said, it's the context. I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it would have helped here necessarily, but they might have been able to step in. and So it wouldn't just be this random article on its own whose basic purpose is just to give you the alert details of these photos. Mm-hmm. It would hopefully had maybe the police would have said something and asked for other people to come forward. I don't know, just something to make it a little bit better, but they're not allowed to talk. And like I said, there, there are everyday new articles about Parnell, right. about his past, about the things he's done. And I think the thinking is that a lot of that is coming from the district attorney in this case. And so the judge wants to stop that. The police go through the letters they find at the Manchester cabin, and they find evidence that Parnell's mother had been giving him money during the seven years he had Stephen. She had written him that it was getting more and more difficult for her to do this. In her later life in Bakersfield, she had become a home nurse taking care of elderly people. And she was getting older herself, so she was retiring, and she was living on a fixed income, and she couldn't keep sending him money. Why is he constantly asking for money? He's he's employed, although I know it's not consistently, but he seems to have a, a relatively decent job. Yeah, he, we know he's setting up businesses, so he might have needed some extra money for that. When police find the stuff at the cabin, they also say that they think he was preparing to move to Arkansas with both boys, so he may have needed money for that. And through the years, sometimes he has jobs, sometimes he doesn't. And also, just moving constantly can cost a lot of money. But it also plays into his, the manipulative nature of Parnell. That idea of, I'm just, you know, I'm going to sponge off my mom as much as possible. Right. And actually, um, several people who knew Parnell and Barbara Matthias when they were together will talk about some of the stuff that, you know, those selling the Bibles. And right. well, several of them kind of talk about how they didn't really see him doing very much at all. It was, some, it was her doing most of the businesses. If you can get somebody else to give you money or do stuff for you, then why do it yourself kind of mentality. Yeah. 
They don't find anything specific in the letters which indicate that his mother knew he had a child with him. There were some interesting things written in some of the letters. One, for instance, warned that if he had another person with him, it would, be, it would bring him trouble. It didn't specifically say a child, but I think police kind of thought this was an odd thing to say. And we know from his other crimes that some of the things he does is, is find women and maybe women who have kids and kind of take advantage of them. Well, his, his mother knew about his previous crime, his previous crime that everyone knows about. In boy Bakersfield. That, right, the boy that was raped in Bakersfield. I can't imagine that she didn't have some kind of inclination. I mean, that, that does sound kind of odd that you would word it that way. Yeah, and throughout the press find her pretty quickly as well and, and want to interview her. She does give some, I don't know if they're full interviews, but she says things to the press. She refers to his to Parnell's older crime as the Troubles. Um, I don't know how much she does know that's going on through the years, but she refuses to answer questions directly about where he's been during the time even before he kidnapped Stephen. But she'll always maintain that she had no idea he had kidnapped a child. And he had visited her throughout the years. And left Stephen with, as we said, the neighbor, right. maybe other people. Well, it goes, again, we've said it quite a bit, but it goes to speak to how manipulative Kenneth Parnell is and how good at it he is that he can snow, snow even his, his mother. Right. And if he did, I mean, I don't, I don't know for sure, but it, it doesn't seem, police never have anything concrete that they can charge her with. Still, his mother is very adamant that her son is innocent of these new crimes and would never hurt a child. She says he loves animals and children and wouldn't do anything to make them happy. She also tells the press, and I assume it's what she tells police when they interview her, that Kenneth Parnell never got over losing either of his wives and his two kids when he, they left him when he committed crimes, if you remember in that episode, and that if he did do something wrong, it was just to build a family. Do you think that this is, might have been her way of living in denial about the kind of person that her son turned out to be or has always been? Yeah, it's possible. And I mean, we went over his life in, in detail in the first episode. He had a lot of trouble as a kid. And I don't know, I for parents, you might feel some of this is your fault or feel guilty. He also had a pretty rough upbringing with his mother. She was a fundamentalist. And I think it sounded like his, as a kid, she was pretty tough on him. Um, there was a time his father, as we said in the first episode, left the family, for instance. And he tried as a young kid to get them back together to kind of set them up on a it sounded like a parent trap kind of thing. And she straight tells him that he has a choice to either accept their divorce or to run away. And he's just a little kid at that time. I think he was like 10. So, I mean, there's just a lot in this relationship besides just us looking at it as a normal mother and son. Right. I, I think anybody that listened to the first episode would not never look at Parnell's early childhood and say that that was a normal childhood. That doesn't excuse what he did. No. And we don't know how much of that has to do with his upbringing or anything like that. Right, exactly. But again, I mean, I imagine for her, it's still her son. Right. And there would have to be some form of either willing ignorance about his crimes and even if, if he's continuing those crimes. Like, I, I, I don't know what you're doing, but I don't want to know it. And if you're doing so, I mean, even that letter, if you are with someone, you can get in trouble. Right. So we will stop here tonight. We've talked a lot. And next episode, we're going to keep on the same track, um, but head to Merced and see what's going on there after the boys come home. And tonight's cold case is brought to you by Charles. Sarah Lou Gammons was an avid piano player and played during Sunday church services at the Gustine Presbyterian Community Church in Gustine, California, which is about 31 miles west of Merced, and was married to the pastor of that same church, Reverend Kenneth Gammons. She also spent her time running an after-school program for local children. On February 16, 1973, sometime after the children left for the day from the after-school program, she would be found by her husband, beaten and stabbed to death. According to the archives of a local newspaper, Sarah's husband found his wife stabbed in the face multiple times. She also had slash wounds to her neck. She had been found in a home on the church's property. If you have any information about Sarah's case, please contact the Merced County District Attorney's Office at 209-385-7381. Thank you for listening to tonight's episode. If you would like to contact us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Cali True Crime. You could also email us at calitruecrime at gmail.com. We would also like to thank our quality control pageant queen, Melanie Duncan, a.k.a. Miss Laughlin. 
This has been a production of Chateau Walnut. Thank you.